We are um, very fortunate today to have as our speaker Christoph Quitman from uh, Max4. Um, Christoph got his uh, PhD at RWTH in Aachen, Germany in 1993. And he actually was involved in, in research on uh, high temperature superconductors. In fact, I guess he spent some time in, in Florida um, uh, during that period. Um, after his PhD, he spent a couple of years as a postdoc at the Wisconsin Synchrotron up the road. Um, following that, he went to the uh, Delta Synchrotron, which is at the uh, University of Dortmund in 1996. He stayed there for two years, uh, left Delta in 1998 for a position at the Swiss Light Source, where he eventually became the uh, Director of Physical Sciences at the SLS. Today, he is at Max4. He's the director of, of the Max4 Laboratory in Lund, Sweden, heavily involved in his MBA lattices. And uh, in fact, we're going to hear a little bit about Max4 today. And the title of this talk is uh, Pushing the Limits at a Light Source. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for coming. It's a great pleasure to be here. I'm impressed by the size of the endeavor you're running here. I come from a small country uh, where the size of your campus is sort of the size of the city where I come from. <laughs> Nevertheless, we're trying to push the limits. And this is uh, the title of my talk. I thought coming to Argonne that has very ambitious upgrade plans for the synchrotron and the beam lines and the science around them, um, it would be appropriate to introduce you to what we are doing in Sweden uh, right now. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to give you a background on what has happened in Sweden where there used to be a small synchrotron called MaxLab and where we are now transitioning to a much bigger facility, the Max4 Laboratory. This is where we are today in downtown Lund, and this is the Greenfield site that we will inaugurate in 2016. <clears throat> I wanted to show you uh, what we have done in terms of the multiband acromat lattice, uh, the new way of generating electron beams with ultra-high brightness, um, and I would like to show you the status that we have for both the ring and the LINAC. I decided not to talk about beamlines because I have to give a second talk tomorrow and I need some material uh, for that. I was told that most of the people who are interested in beamlines would not be here anyways. They would be at the coherence workshop. So that's, if you want to hear that, uh, come there tomorrow. I will talk uh, briefly about the FEL, um, which can be built at the Max4 site and which we are planning for right now but there's still a question mark that is largely connected to funding for this project. Um, and I would like to introduce you uh, to the environment where we're operating, where not only a synchrotron is built, but also uh, the world's most powerful uh, pulse spallation source will be in Lund uh, in 2019. Good. Synchrotrons are magic lamps. They allow us to make the invisible visible. And the first image that ever was produced with x-rays is this image that uh, Konrad Wilhelm Röntgen took of his wife. This is her hand, and you can see the wedding band. This has fascinated people in science, but in all parts of society as well, uh, for now more than 120 years. It was, in those days, achieved with very high-tech equipment. This is a picture of the original apparatus that Röntgen had available it would have almost fit onto this table here. But it was the most high-tech equipment that you could think of in these days. Today, we have much higher ambitions. We want to see things that are much, much more complicated than only the bones in this hand. We want to see nano um, electronics, nano uh, transistors in operation, in full spatial resolution, we want to look at the interaction of biological molecules with nanostructures, for example, where we need to combine spectroscopy and microscopy. We want to do protein crystallography on the most difficult proteins, the ones that are 
uh, forming the membrane of the cell, for example, and that hate to crystallize, that cannot be grown in crystals that are big enough for conventional X-ray crystallography, but that only grow in microcrystals. So for all of this, we need brightness and we need coherent light. And that is why we are today building facilities that are much more complicated than what Röntgen had available, but they're also much more powerful uh, in terms of the science that they can do. So why do we need brightness and coherence? Brightness and coherence define the quality of the light that we get. And ultimately, they are given by the accelerators that produce the light. Um, if you want to go into that, there's a brand new issue of the Journal of Synchrotron Radiation. It came out the day before yesterday, and it deals with uh, diffraction-limited storage rings, the future of accelerators and the science that you can do. Uh, and there's contributions by Bob Hettel and uh, Michael Borland in there that discuss all of this. But these are the fundamental equations behind that. We would like to have a diffraction-limited light source, um, a light source whose properties are only given by the wavelength of the light that you want to have. And that requires an emittance of the electron beam of order lambda over 4 pi or lambda over 2 pi. So the emittance of the accelerator that produces that light is really the thing that drives the quality. You can look at the brightness of the light source. It has this prefactor here, which is the spectral flux. But to um, be able to use these nanobeams, you need the brightness. You need the convoluted um, diffraction-limited intensity from, depending on your wavelength, convoluted with the emittance of the electron beam. And the important thing is that you have a two-dimensional source. You need emittance in the horizontal and in the vertical direction. You can, in principle, blow up your beam um, by changing the coupling between the horizontal and the vertical. That could decrease the horizontal source size and increase the vertical source size, but it doesn't really help you all that much. What we are operating with at third generation light sources are beams like this. And they are the best that we can do today. But what we would really like to have is a diffraction limited light source, a spot like source whose properties are only given by the wavelength of the light that we need for our experiment. So what we're doing today is the accelerator physicists are building storage rings that will dramatically decrease the horizontal source size so that we come much closer to the diffraction limit, which is the fundamental limit uh, for any light source. Why are people so crazy about coherence? Why are people here at APS, at MAX4, ESRF, Sirius, Spring 8, ALS, all talking about diffraction limited light sources? Um, I actually stole uh, a slide from Eric Isaacs uh, on your science case, because I like it. I think it captures a lot of the essence. Today, we have light sources that create disordered beams. And we can use them to study samples, provided that they are ordered, provided that they are so regular that they diffract into Bragg peaks. Then we can analyze the structure of our samples. But in the future, what we will have are ordered beams, coherent beams, where we can take much more disordered samples because, and we can look at them, because we know the properties of our source much better. This will allow us to look at materials that today cannot reasonably be studied with synchrotron light. So it will allow us to look at multi-scale materials like metamaterials where you have different properties on different scales, where you need information about both the atomic scale but also the micron or possibly even centimeter scale to understand the properties of these materials. It will allow us to look at disordered materials. And something that I find quite fascinating is to look at materials near a phase transition where you have a transition away from such a rigid lattice where a material uh, starts to acquire defects and then goes over into the liquid state, for example. 
You need coherent beams to study such materials because the approximation of an ordered sample breaks down. This is an example of uh, one of my last experiments uh, in Switzerland before I went to Sweden. We studied such um, complex materials. This here is a cement sample, uh, almost 100 microns in every direction. And using coherent imaging, we could look into this material. We could do three-dimensional imaging and get resolutions that are smaller than the spot size of the X-ray focused beams because we knew that the beam was coherent. Then modern phase retrieval algorithms allow you to reconstruct information approximately a factor of 50 smaller than the diameter of your beam. Coherent, using coherent beams for experiments also means that we get more information out of our experiment. And in particular, we get more information per radiation damage. Whenever we shine an X-ray beam onto a sample, there will be radiation damage. So we have to try to outrun that. And in particular, fields that are sensitive to radiation damage, like life science experiments, will profit from these coherent beams. This plot here was taken from Bob Hettel's uh, article in this uh, special volume of uh, synchrotron radiation. And it shows the coherent fraction that you can get out of a source as a function of the source emittance. And it does that for different wavelengths here. And this line here is the 50% coherence limit. So in Sweden, we are interested in what you would call soft x-rays. We call them hard x-rays. We're interested in, say, one angstrom or even longer wavelengths. These are these curves here. Um, so far, we are operating with sources that have a few nanometer radians. And I have picked my old home, the Swiss light source, is a 2.4 GeV ring operating at 4 nanometers. So you can see that uh, even at three angstroms, you get um, a deploring 1% coherence uh, out of these sources. That is not good. Most of the light that these sources deliver in the hard X-ray region are, is incoherent. But still, it allows us, through clever experiments, to do very sophisticated imaging techniques. Now, with the new sources that are coming online, this line here is for the new MUX4 3GV ring that will have an emittance of below 0.3 nanometer radiant. We are moving to this line here. And it shows that if you're working at a few angstroms wavelength, you get up to something like 10% of coherent light out of this. So we will get, for all the imaging experiments, where we want to have diffraction-limited X-ray spots, we will get a lot more light. We will get at least one order of magnitude more light. And this will allow us to do experiments uh, that are impossible today, or um, at least it will allow changing things that are uh, really brute force work to become routine so that we can roll it out to a user community that is not willing to uh, put one sample into the beam for an entire week. They want to look at a series of materials to get an understanding of changes that are happening there. So if we want to get better coherence out of these light sources, there are three steps. The most important one is to minimize the emittance of the electron beam. And these multiband achromat lattices are a good way of doing that. There's also um, a trick that you can play by changing the optics, the beta function of the uh, electron beam in your insertion device. That's the difference between the solid line and the dashed line. You see that this gives you maybe 50% more coherence. There are tricks that the machine people can play to give us more coherence. Last but not least, there is a way to play with a coupling, the coupling of the horizontal and the vertical uh, orbit in the machine that will give more coherent light at long wavelengths, but you pay a price uh, by having uh, less coherent light at hard X-ray wavelengths. So that's probably not uh, good for everybody. 
So let me introduce you to our project and let me try to show you how we are moving from this building where the laboratory has been residing since the late 80s to this building where we will move into in 2015. We are a national user facility hosted by Lund University and we have two missions. One is academic research and one is industrial uh, service. So this here is the number of users that come to our facility as a function of time, as it has evolved since the late 1980s. So today we have close to 1,000 users. For you, this is a small number, but remember, uh, all of Sweden has as many inhabitants as the greater Chicago area. So I think we're doing quite well. 1,000 users from the state of Illinois would be quite an achievement. It all started with physics, and in the late 90s, uh, we acquired the possibility to produce hard x-rays using superconducting wigglers, and that opened the facility to life science and to chemistry, and now they make up about half of our user community. We are quite proud to have a very international crowd at our facility. This is the allocated beam time in 2013, and you can see in terms of beam time, Sweden only uses about 45% of the facility. All the rest goes to users that come from outside of Sweden. Most of them come from Denmark or the other uh, Scandinavian countries, but roughly a third comes uh, from the rest of Europe, and we get occasional users from the US or Japan or Korea to our facility. And we're quite proud of that because that means that we are delivering something that is useful. People are willing to travel a long way to use the MUX facility. We also serve industrial customers. Right now, it's about 5% of the total beam time. Uh, we are operating at present almost exclusively in the soft x-ray range, so much of the uh, industrial work that takes place at hard x-ray range is inaccessible to us, but we hope to up that number in the future. Uh, there's a very broad spectrum of companies that comes to us. Uh, some of them are multinational pharma companies, for example, like Novo or Astra. Some of them uh, are um, companies coming from a very different field. Tetra Pak uh, does the milk cartons uh, and sells them all over the world. They are interested in small angle scattering. Um, and some of them are quite uh, small local companies that uh, come to our facility. This is the new site that we are building at present, um, and I would like to introduce you to the thinking that went into this Greenfield site. The um, founding principles um, that are behind the design that I will show you. So the first assumption was that storage rings will be the backbone of synchrotron radiation for many years to come. If you want to service a thousand or several thousand users, a storage ring, as far as we understand, is the only way of doing it, because you can host tens of experiments at a storage ring. But to serve users requires to maximize the brightness and the coherence that you get out of this. If brightness and coherence are your design criteria, then undulators are the best sources. Uh, actually, MAX4 will be the first synchrotron source worldwide, as far as I know, that relies entirely on undulators. We will not have bent magnet beam lines. All the beam lines will be running on undulators. We also think that undulators are far superior to wigglers, uh, and therefore we will have as few wigglers as possible. In Sweden, there's a long tradition of providing ultraviolet light, um, and a relatively recent tradition only of providing hard x-rays. We have a user community that starts at 5 EV, and it goes up to some 30, possibly 50 kV. So a decision was taken very early on that it was impossible to serve all of these users well using a single ring. If you want that broad spectrum, you have to have two different storage rings. Second major assumption is Time-resolved experiments are cool and are really cutting edge these days, but a storage ring is not the best source to do ultra-fast dynamics experiments. Therefore, it was decided to have a LINAC injector that could also drive what we call the short pulse facility or the femtomax beamline, 
uh, to do femtosecond dynamics. Having this will allow us to build a free electron laser uh, in the future. This is the first half, approximately, of what you need to do a free electron laser. Third assumption was a small country can only afford small rings. Um, a facility like you have it with more than a kilometer circumference is impossible in a small country like Sweden. So to use very hard x-rays, we rely on collaborations with others, and Sweden is a member of the European Synchrotron Radiation Facility and is actually financing um, a hard x-ray beamline at Petra 3 to do the science that requires x-rays above about 30 keV. So if these are the design principles, what is the facility looking like that we are building? Well, first let me show you the old facility. This is what we have operated since the late 80s and that what we will be operating until Christmas next year. It is three different storage rings. The largest of them has 96 meters circumference. Uh, so this is a small facility. If on the same scale you plot the new facility, this is what it looks like. It is much bigger, much more complex, and much more powerful. And by the way, it is a little bit more expensive. So it all starts with uh, the electron source here. Um, we take the electrons and shoot them into a LINAC. The LINAC first accelerates them to 1.5 GeV, and then we inject them to a small storage ring. We need that small storage ring to provide high quality light from undulators for experiments between about 5 EV at the lower end and 200 or 250 EV at the higher end. That can be done very well at a 1.5 GV ring. If you want harder x-rays, then the LINAC has to accelerate to 3 GV. Um, oh, actually, I have an animation for that, sorry. This comes first. To give you a feeling of the size, um, this is a 528 meter circumference ring, um, and a building that would snugly fit in there is the Colosseum in Rome. It has 526 meter circumference, so it would just fit into our storage ring. But we will not keep uh, gladiators or lions there. We're building this for scientists. And the scientists need these accelerators. So this is the animation. The LINAC first accelerates to 1.5 GV, then uh, into that ring where we can provide soft x-rays. Then we can take it another step to 3 GV, accelerate into the big uh, hard x-ray ring, and feed uh, up to 19 experiments with hard x-rays. When the LINAC is not busy injecting into these rings, which it should do only once every five or 10 minutes for topping them up, then we can run it into the short pulse facility where we get spontaneous emission out of a four and a half meter long undulator and can do experiments on a sub 100 femtosecond scale. And if we get money in the future, we can build an FEL uh, by adding another accelerator and building beamlines out here. This is what the site looked like uh, about two months ago. From the outside, not much is changing anymore. Um, the building is almost complete. Um, actually, we have access since March last year. Um, then we started installing the LINAC, which is underground and starts here um, and injects into this building where we have the 1.5 GV ring. Uh, we will become owner of the whole facility in June next year. Then the building project will be completed. So the LINAC at present is under commissioning, and I'll show you first results. The 3 GV ring, which is in this building here, um, is in installation as we speak, and the 1.5 GV ring, which is in this square building, is still in fabrication of the components. At present, we have 13 beamlines financed. Eight of them are in fabrication, which means the design is completed and we have procured the components to companies. We have two beamlines that are in design. We have three beamlines that we will take from the existing facility and move to the new one. And we have five beamlines where we are still uh, looking for funding to realize them in the next year. 
Once that is completed, we will start phase three, and we have space for approximately eight more beam lines uh, that are not yet defined and are far from being funded uh, today. For a small country, um, this is a huge project. This is actually the biggest project that Sweden has ever done in research infrastructure. So to get it off the ground, it was very important to show that we had the community behind us. And the best sign of the community being behind you is if somebody takes his or her own money and invests it into your project. And this is what the project managed. These are 12 Swedish universities that all took their own money and sent it to Lund in order to build beam lines at the new facility. This convinced the Knut and Alice Wallenberg Foundation, a private charity, to chip in the missing 80% of the money uh, to build the beam lines. So it was quite a good deal for the universities, but psychologically it was extremely important. Um, Together with these, beam, these universities, we are now building the suit of 13 first beam lines. These are the first beam lines that were in the project, and I will just run you very quickly through them to explain what we do. Uh, beam line number one is for femtosecond dynamics in solids. So this sits at the end of the long LINAC and will receive 100 femtosecond X-ray pulses between about two and a half and 18 keV. We have a beamline for nanoimaging and spectroscopy. You would call that the hard X-ray nanoprobe. And for us, this is a long beamline, but in fact, it is only 100 meters. So on an international scale, it is not very long. We have a beamline looking at in situ catalysis, doing EXAFs mostly. We have a protein crystallography beamline, and the community opted to have a high throughput beamline although I would have preferred a microfocus beamline, but this is something that will have to come in the upgrade program. We have um, a large community working on resonant inelastic X-ray scattering. This is uh, low energies, um, transition metal L edges, say 500 to 1500 EV, uh, looking at uh, electronic and magnetic excitations in solids. We have a beamline with a fancy name of HIPPIE, um, stands for high pressure photoemission, uh, and for this community, high pressure is millibar, it's not gigapascals. So they look at um, reactions on surfaces, water uh, on surfaces, and things like that. Angle resolved photoemission to do band mapping is a must. That is where Sweden has a strong tradition and community. Uh, so we have a beamline here on the soft X ray ring that will do this with very high resolution. Um, this beamline here, finest beams, is not only a clever acronym, uh, but it was also politically very important for us that the uh, countries of Estonia and Finland invested their own money. They bought into our project. They are financing a beamline for gas phase and cluster physics, looking at aerosols uh, and things like that. Species is another resonant inelastic X-ray scattering beamline. It's actually a beamline we're building up at the existing facility to test all the hardware and the installation procedures, and we will move it to the new facility as soon as that comes online. Then in 2013, the Swedish Research Council, Wetenskapsrådet, gave us funding for another set of beamlines. Two of them will be transferred from the existing facility, a photoemission electron microscope looking at surfaces using soft X-rays, and uh, an XPS uh, experiment, and two brand new beamlines, a coherent small angle X-ray scattering beamline to look at soft matter and biological materials, and a soft X-ray imaging beamline with two branches, a scanning transmission X-ray microscope for the more routine things, and a coherent imaging setup to develop new coherent imaging techniques. So these are the first 13 beamlines that we are uh, building right now. Multiband acronym, yeah, yes? Initially, people would have like common detections, known spectrum, exams. What happened to those? Yeah, good question. Um, when, ah, sorry. Uh, traditionally, uh, on a synchrotron, you would have powder diffraction um, and small angle scattering and other things. Uh, 
Um, yes, this is a political question. In our case, the proposal was put forward to the Knut and Alice Wallenberg Foundation. I think it contained 21 beamlines. Uh, they were unwilling to fund 21 beamlines in one go, and I think it would not have been a good idea because it would have locked the facility forever. Um, so after a referee uh, process, they decided to fund seven beamlines, the seven beamlines that the referees liked best. Powder diffraction came in somewhat lower. So uh, this is why we have to raise money for that. Um, it's difficult to make these things. Not everybody's happy with that decision, but uh, this is the way it went. So one thing uh, that I think it is fair to say um, where Sweden is leading is the design of accelerators, the multiband acromat lattice, which pushes the limits of current technology in accelerator physics. And I would like to introduce you to the concept and the status that we have so far. Um, the brightness that you get out of an electron accelerator when you look at the x-rays square scales as one of the emittance of the electron accelerator squared. And you can look at the emittance, what governs that. And that is the energy and the number of magnets that you use to guide the electron beam around a circle. Um, increasing the energy is very costly. Um, it means a bigger facility and it means a much bigger operations budget to pay for the electricity bill. So for a small and poor country, this is not an option. Um, people have worked long trying to minimize this prefactor, but whenever they did it, they found out that the beam became unstable. Nobody has yet found a clever way to minimize this uh, theoretical minimum emittance uh, and still keep the electron beam stable, even in simulation. So the obvious thing is to work on this factor here, which has uh, a cubic influence. Um, however, the first time you think about it, the more magnets you put, the bigger the thing becomes and the more expensive it becomes. So uh, it was ruled out uh, early on by many people. It would be impossible to build a few kilometer circumference ring in a small country. This would require a project of the size of Petra 3 or uh, you have the, the PEPEX plan in Stanford that would use a huge ring to uh, bring down the emittance. But Mikael Eriksson and his team in Sweden came up with um, another way of doing it. They just decided, OK, if we need many magnets to bring down the emittance, then the trick to do that is to make the magnets small. And the second trick is, rather than having many separate magnets, let's put them all, or let's group them and put many of them into a single block of iron. So really, the main thought behind these multiband acromat lattices is let's build combined function units where many magnets that have different functionality are carved out of a single block of iron so that you outsource a lot of the installation and fabrication cost to somebody who's good in CNC machining. You do the design once, you make a drawing, you put a block of iron on the CNC mill, press a button, and the machine rattles on to deliver you this magnet. That is the thought. And I will show you how far we've gotten. So many small gap dipole magnets, uh, machine them out of the bulk, introduce strong focusing in each cell. That is what is needed to bring down the emittance. It requires that we have not only quadrupoles and sextopoles, but also octopoles. It makes for a very complicated beam dynamics, and uh, you have to go through a lot of thinking and hard work to keep the dynamic aperture and the lifetime up. But we think that we have solved this. Um, there's a lot of modeling that goes into this. Last but not least, you have to realize that vacuum and magnets are now a unit. You cannot treat them separately anymore. Um, if you shrink the size of the magnets, that has a strong influence on the vacuum system. And um, I will show you how we have solved this. 
If you're interested in the history, again, this new volume of synchrotron radiation has an article by Dieter Einfeld on the early history uh, of multiband acromat lattices, and it has an article by Pedro Fernandez Tavares uh, describing our uh, project. Here's a CAD drawing of one of our magnets. Uh, it is one out of 140 magnets. The green thing that you see is a block of iron, in this case 2.3 meters long uh, and about one foot wide. And out of that block of iron, um, we have machined an octopole magnet, the dipole magnet here, a quarter pole, another octopole, another quarter pole, and another octopole here. The core of those magnets is machined out of iron, and then you wind a coil and drop it on top of that. So you can put all these magnets in one unit, and they are pre-aligned on the CNC machine. It requires quite um, sophisticated know-how in terms of CNC machining, because over the length of two and a half, or the longest magnet is actually 3.3 meters, you need a precision of 10 microns. That is not easy, but it can be done. Uh, Danphysik and Scanditronics uh, in Denmark and Sweden have both fabricated approximately half of the magnets, and they have delivered these specifications. Actually, the precision is significantly better than what we need. It is down to five microns on most of the magnets. Then you assemble them in groups. This is our seven bend acromat, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven bend magnets, and the quadrupoles and sextopoles uh, between them. So this is what the CAD drawing looks like. This is what the real thing looks like. This is a single block of iron, 2.3 meters long. This here is the dipole, and what you see here, this yellowish thing, is the coil dropped on top of the magnet core. You can see a quadrupole here, a sextopole here, another quadrupole here. And what you can also see quite nicely is that a lot of the infrastructure work is already done. It is done at the factory. All the cabling, um, all the water plumbing is done here. You have only one uh, water connection, and I think you have three electrical connections on this entire group of magnets. All the alignment work is done. There is no possibility to uh, change the alignment between these two. That means you need to have a lot of trust into your modeling and into your design. But we do, uh, and in part because we have a lot of international colleagues like Michael Borland here at APS who have looked at this design, who have checked every conceivable aspect, and we believe it'll work. Here's another photograph showing you, for example, the quadrupoles, and this here is a sextopole, and all the cabling that goes on with it. This is what such a unit looks like in CAD. Um, this is a high concrete stand, very stiff, very rigid, but very cheap. Um, very short legs here that allow to align it, but have high resonance frequencies to keep the thing stable. And then the two magnet halves and the vacuum pipe going through it. That's CAD, and this is reality. This is the mock-up that we have done during the summer, uh, where close to our existing facility, we have built one full acromat to check the installation procedure, mechanical tolerances, and so forth. This is the concrete stand. This is the alignment. This is the magnet. And what you see here is a sextopole uh, sticking out. The magnet gap, in our case, is 22 millimeters. That is very small by today's standards. And it has a profound impact on the vacuum system. This is the vacuum system as you find it in most third generation sources. Happens to be Alba. Uh, could as well be the Swiss light source. 31 millimeters here and quite wide here. And a huge elbow to put uh, ion pumps or TSP pumps and suck out the vacuum. This is what the magnet system of Max 4 looks like. It's a 22 millimeter diameter copper tube, 528 meters in circumference, one millimeter thick. There's no way that you can connect large pumping volume ion pumps or turbo pumps or TSPs. The only way that we know to do this is to make the vacuum chamber itself a pump. And this means you need to neck coat this chamber. 
along the entire length of half a kilometer, every single vacuum chamber in our system is coated with a few microns of neg material. Neg material is a, a proprietary recipe that was um, developed by alchemists at CERN. It's an alloy of different materials that have the ability, if they are heated, to become activated and to become very efficient pumps of light elements. So they, the walls of our chamber, they will be the pump for the entire storage ring. Doing that is a prerequisite for these small magnetic gap magnets. This is another CAD drawing showing you one of these blocks, and this is the vacuum chamber as it sits in there. The vacuum chamber has integrated beam position monitors, like this one here, uh, bolted next to the quadrupole so that the BPM is rigidly aligned with respect to the center of the quads that defines the optical axis. Um, this is that chamber in CAD. This is the BPM. Uh, you can see uh, cooling channels here that provide cooling on the outside to get rid of the synchrotron radiation that is produced in the bent magnets. Um, and you can see that the chamber is curved. Um, again, we will not use bent magnets at light sources. We consider bent magnets a nuisance, really. They produce light, but it is light of a lower quality than what we can get out of um, insertion devices. So we have designed this lattice so that as little as possible power comes from the bent magnets. The field in the bent magnets is only half a tesla. That is about one third of what most synchrotrons use. That means there's very little power coming out of it, and that makes it easy or even possible to live with a vacuum system and a cooling system as we have it in our design here. I already said that we did a test installation. This is another photograph of that test installation um, where we did 1 20th of the full ring, and that was completed three weeks ago, I think. What you see down here is the concrete stand on which we have mounted the alignment tools for half of the magnet. This here is only the lower half, and what you see is a quadrupole, and the other two poles would be coming from the top half. The top half has been removed because up here we have suspended the vacuum chamber, which is 20 meters long, uh, has about one meter of curvature over that ring, um, and is hanging from a strong back here where it has been assembled, has been uh, pumped and activated, and is now ready to be lowered into that magnet gap. Here you can see the whole installation. These are the seven uh, magnets of the Acromat, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then there must be one here. Uh, and this is the 20 meter vacuum chamber hanging here, ready for installation. Uh, once it has been installed and the magnet halves have been uh, put back, uh, this is what it looks like. This is one acromat. Um, if you've ever been to the APS tunnel, um, remember the size of the magnets that you have today in today's facility. These are really tiny magnets that we're putting here. Multiband acromat lattices, I think, are the new trend. Uh, and I would like to show the advantages um, compared to my old facility in Switzerland. This is um, the facility that was built in Switzerland and inaugurated in 2001. It was a world-leading facility at that time. It was the best that people could do. This is a bent magnet at that facility. The red ones are the quadrupoles here. Uh, they're about the size of this uh, desk here. Um, this is the new facility that we are building, and this is a quadrupole at the Max 4 facility. Much smaller, much more compact, and much less energy consumption. This has been picked up by many people, and this is a way to get into nature, for example. This is an article uh, talking about the ultimate upgrade for you as synchrotrons, but actually a little bit of it uh, reflects on what is happening at Box 4. Uh, these yellow parts are where we are mentioned, and we were quite happy about that. This plot here shows brightness curves. 
It's very difficult um, to uh, come to an agreement on these curves. That's why I take uh, results that other people have produced so that I cannot be um, accused of falsifying them. But this here is the brightness on a logarithmic scale as a function of photon energy, and the MUX4 source is this one here. Um, it has been optimized to work between the soft X-ray region, say 200 or 500 eV, up to about 20 keV, and that is where it really performs well. If you want to do experiments at harder x-rays, this is not the right source. Then you should go to APS, or we will be going to PETRA-3 and ESRF. There are other sources that provide better brightness here in that region. Um, in the new article in the Journal of Synchrotron Radiation, uh, there's a list that shows the different projects that are right now trying to implement such new lattices and it shows here the maximum brightness that you can get out of it uh, as a function of photon energy. The light gray are existing sources. The dark gray are the coming sources, that is MUX4 and NSLS2. They will both have very comparable emittance, but use different technology. And these curves here are the facilities that are planning upgrades that want to use something like this. And you can see a clear trend uh, there will be fierce competition, and the brightness will go up, and it will move the spectrum up to harder x-rays. And that will provide more coherent light out of these sources. So uh, a lot better opportunities for x-ray imaging in particular. Some more uh, results on what we have already and what we will be providing. This is a picture, uh, a downstream view of the MAX-4 LINAC that is seven meters underground at our facility and already in commissioning. The LINAC itself is quite an interesting uh, piece of accelerator physics. Um, it was not only designed to simply uh, be a, an injector into storage rings. It was designed with a free electron laser in mind. So it has two different guns. It has a thermionic gun up here for high reliability, straight injection into the storage rings. And it does that at 1.5 GeV and at 3 GeV. But in addition to that, it has a photocathode here um, that allows to create short pulses. And the pulses can be compressed using two bunch compressors that we have operational at 260 MeV and at full energy, which is 3 GeV now. They are necessary to compress the pulse so that we can run it into the short pulse facility and do ultra-fast physics there. In the short pulse facility, we should be able to accelerate a few tens or a few hundred picocoulombs. We can do it with a rep rate of up to 100 hertz. This is a copper LINAC, it's warm technology, so 100 hertz is sort of a natural limit. And depending on how we tune these bunch compressors, we can vary the compression between a few 10 femtoseconds and a few picoseconds here. These bunch compressors are actually quite innovative. Um, they use double acromats for the compression, and they use linear, for linearization, they use sextopoles. This is a cheap way to do it. It's a relatively simple way. You don't need additional RF in these things, and that was important for us because we are a small team, and we need to not only consider performance, but also reliability. Um, and maintenance, operational cost in this. But it will allow um, to compress the pulses and not only um, turn the long pulse uh, upside down to make it short, but also uh, take out the curvature so that we get a flat pulse and we're confident that we will reach a few 10 femtosecond uh, resolution. So we have first commissioning results here. They're only a week old, so they're from the thermionic gun. They are on crest acceleration and no compression. Uh, there's a couple of screens here. On the first one, you don't see much. On the second one, you see that there's an electron beam. And the third screen is at the end of the first acromat. Uh, so this is where we have a maximum in the dispersion. And from this pattern here, we could calculate that the beam energy at this first try was 280 MeV. Design goal is 260, so everything's fine. Uh, things are starting to work at this facility. Uh, let 
Ja, es gibt das mal. Ähm, Lund is, try, is building more than a synchrotron. And what we are trying to do here is really to build a large campus that will be a world leading uh, resource to do material science. This is a drawing of the city architect of Lund that shows what this region should be looking like in about 2035. This is our project here, the large storage ring um, of Max 4. Right next to it, within a kilometer, they're building the European Spallation Source. And I have to tell you that I missed out on the uh, first um, digging event yesterday because I uh, had three months ago promised to come here for the colloquium. Uh, I missed a, f a free beer, and in Sweden, a free beer is really something expensive. <laughs> so the ESS is a European project building a five megawatt proton accelerator um, to generate neutrons by spallation. They have started uh, construction yesterday. Uh, they expect to have first neutrons 2019 and will build 23 instruments that will be working in very similar areas of material science like we do uh, with the X-ray source. So there's the European spallation source as our new neighbor as of yesterday. Um, this region here is called Science Village Scandinavia and is being developed by a company co-owned by the region, the university, um, and uh, the two facilities here. And uh, in the future, Lund University will move part of its campus up here. Uh, very likely, the Lund Laser Center will be the first one to uh, move out here to the new campus, and we're very much looking forward to be working together with them. In the end, I want to mention one point that has been very uh, important in all the design of this, and this is sustainability. Um, from the beginning, it was clear that Lund had the ambition to develop not only this facility, but that entire part of the city as a sustainable region. And the one very important aspect of sustainability is energy consumption. So we have a three-step philosophy in trying to keep the energy consumption low. The first prerequisite is reduce the consumption of energy as much as possible. If you cannot reduce it any further, then think about reusing things. And the last is recycle. If you have used it time and again, then recycle it somewhere else. So how are we implementing that? The accelerator itself is a very energy efficient uh, construction. Because the magnet gaps are so small, the volume of iron that you need to magnetize up is very small. Plus, because of this multiband acromat lattice, we have very weak dipoles. We're about a factor of three lower in field, and we're at least a factor of three smaller in volume. So that means that the total power that we consume per meter of accelerator is only 10% of what we use at the existing facility. So even though we're blowing the ring up by a factor of five, we will be able to operate it with only half the electrical power that we are using uh, for the existing ring. As a director, I find this very cool because paying electricity bills is very uncool. But hiring staff to do science or being able to invest money into new detectors, new instrumentation, is a lot more fun. Another thing that we're doing that is helping us with energy efficiency is we're using 100 megahertz RF. There's a physics reason for that, and that is because we are compressing the electron beam spatially. We're bringing down the emittance by a factor of 20, approximately. The charge density goes up. Um, and charge density is bad for dynamics and for lifetime. So one way to recover from that is to stretch the bunches in the longitudinal direction. That means our bunches are not as short as they are here. Typically, synchrotrons provide 70 picosecond bunch length. We will have 350. 
but we have a short pulse facility for the really demanding uh, ultra-fast dynamics where we can go to the sub-100 femtosecond uh, time structure. But the RF transmitters have um, uh, an energy efficiency in excess of 60%. So they're very efficient in delivering uh, energy to the electron beam and not wasting it uh, in the uh, klystrons. We also took this philosophy to the, the building, so the material that we're using and the lightning that we have uh, in the building all aims at reducing uh, energy consumption and material. We're reusing a lot of facilities like the linear accelerator acts as an injector, it drives the short pulse facility, and it will be reused as an FEL. When we look at the site, the excavation, um, we have used the material that we had to dig up from the tunnel for the LINAC for vibration damping and for radiation safety to minimize uh, the use of land and the use of energy in the building process. Last but not least, we recycle. The electrical energy that we use to accelerate and that is um, producing hot water in the end will be used for local district heating and we can heat up to 1,800 houses. We have a contract with uh, Kraftringen, the ring of power, the local electricity provider. They buy, they sell us electricity and they buy back hot water and they use that for local district heating. The condition for that is that a lot of the power um, is offered at 55 degrees Celsius. So we have a, a separate water circuit that is the high power load circuit that operates at 55 degrees. We sell that water to the electricity provider. They use heat pumps and then pump it up to 75 degrees. And then there's a local district syst heating system in Lund my house will be heated by hot water coming from the synchrotron. Quite a nice thought. Okay, I am running out of time. A few slides on the FEL. We have the ambition to build an FEL. This is what it could look like. This is the existing LINAC, which right now drives this Femtomax beamline. If we get money, we can build an extension, add some 3 GV, to the facility, to the electron beam, and then run it through a series of undulators, and that would uh, provide uh, an X-ray FEL. With the existing facility already, if we had more undulators, we could bring it to lasing in the soft X-ray region. These are tentative parameters. We think that 6 GV is probably a good compromise um, when you balance uh, cost and performance. We think that um, the wavelength or the energy range that is the sweet spot of coherent imaging or diffraction is not necessarily down to uh, one angstrom. Uh, we think that staying at a few angstroms, we can do a lot of the science, and it is much cheaper and technically much easier than going up to uh, very much shorter wavelengths. Um, we already have the space. This here is a photograph of the short pulse facility hall. The FEL would be coming down this line here. All that we need is a little bit of money. Um, so what we are doing today is we are applying for a planning grant to give us money to do the conceptual design report in the next two years. Then we would put in an application and we would hope to start building the facility around 2018. Um, What's next in diffraction-limited storage rings? I think diffraction-limited storage rings are only one step. What we want to do is the best possible science, and that I like to think of as a chain. Uh, there are many links in that chain, and if you have one link, um, then the result of that chain, the science that you can get, will not be world-leading. So we have started with one link, and that is the storage ring. There will be storage rings that will beat us in terms of emittance. I'm convinced there will be storage rings with a few 10 picometers emittance uh, in the future. They will provide harder x-rays than we can. They will operate at smaller gaps, and possibly they will even manage to operate the facility at short pulses. 
I think one of the key areas where we can all really profit and where I was very impressed by the effort that is going on here at APS is insertion device development. If we have electron beams that are approaching a circular shape, then we must look at insertion devices with fourfold symmetry that take advantage of the fact that uh, the beam is not so wide anymore. It is now like a, a filament. Uh, also, superconducting insertion devices, I think, have a great potential uh, to get even higher brightness out of these diffraction-limited storage rings. Optics will be a huge challenge. If you have a diffraction-limited source, you need diffraction-limited optics. You need meter-long mirrors that are close to perfect, and that is very difficult. We will need to look very hard into diagnostics. We will need the photon beam as an information what the source is doing. And we will need feedback to the machine, from beam lines to machine, to stabilize and optimize the accelerator. An area that I think is a weak link today is detectors. Um, I, come, I used to work in Switzerland for 15 years. I was following the pixel detector development. I think this is a huge contribution to the community, but still there's a lot of work that needs to be done. We need larger detectors, smaller pixels, and we need high efficiency both in the soft x-rays but also in the hard x-rays. That's more important for you than it is for me. We will need a lot of software to mine through our data, and we need new simulation tools. We need the possibility to simulate all the way from the source to the detector and we will need new concepts, new optical layouts for beamlines that take advantage of the new source properties. So this is what I think uh, we should be working at. And if you're interested in more, you can read the introduction that Michael Eriksson, Friso van der Feen, and I wrote in that synchrotron uh, radiation special volume. OK, before I go, I have to give credit to the Max 4 team. This is a wonderful bunch of people. There are 175 people that are presently running three accelerators, 12 beamlines, building three more accelerators, and 13 beamlines on that. So this is very thin staff, but they are really good, and it's a pleasure to work with them. Um, and this is my last slide, I promise. Um, I invite you for the inauguration of our facility. Um, this is a light source in Sweden, so we decided for a symbolic uh, date for the inauguration. Um, in Sweden, midsummer is a big thing, as you might know. So I invite you for the inauguration of Max 4, which will happen on Tuesday, June 21st, 2016, noon local time, the brightest time of the year for the brightest source in the world. And local time is 1 o'clock, 8 minutes and 55 seconds Central European Daylight Savings Time. See you there. I didn't quite understand why you would save energy when you still have to bend the electrons 360 degrees. So whether the field is high or low, you will still have to bend the electrons and you will still have to generate the same synchrotron radiation. Am I wrong? Yeah. We generate very little synchrotron radiation. It's only 500 kilowatts in the dipoles. Um, and you have to keep in mind that the hysteresis curve of iron becomes very nonlinear at high fields. It's easy to magnetize iron to half a Tesla, but it becomes exceedingly difficult and energy consuming and expensive if you go beyond that. Uh, 1.5 Tesla is close to the saturation magnetization, and that means you need very large currents. Thank you. Back. How long will the NEG material in your neg pumps last, and what happens, like, if something really bad happens and you vent your ring and you get air in there, then you have to like replenish the whole thing, don't yeah. you? Um, the calculations say that it will last some tens of years. Whether this is one ten or two tens, we will see. Um, this is a technology that was developed at CERN. CERN uses it in the LHC. Soleil uses it. We use it on the Max 3 ring since many years, and it has not yet failed. 
Um, the important thing is you must not vent these things. So you have to take a lot of precaution um, when designing the beamlines and when instructing the users. Um, but fast closing valves on beamlines that are tens of meters long are not rocket science anymore. Um, what happens if an accident does happen? I can tell you in Switzerland it happened once. We didn't have neg coating, but it was a similar thing um, where we had to take out an entire uh, sector, um, bake it, which is baking at 120 degrees or so. It's not activating at 180 degrees. Um, and that was done in one week. That's bad. It's very bad. It upsets the users. It upsets the staff. But a week, once every 10 or SLS is now running 12 years, is OK. Apparently, one of the most dangerous things is fluorine. Uh, fluorine kills the neck coating, so we have to be very careful with that. Requires some rethinking of uh, design concepts when it comes to pumps and monochromators and things like that. But I think it can be handled. As I'm sure you realize, the coherence makes windows very difficult. Yeah. You need very high quality windows to bring the beam out. Do you have a development program? What is your program for window development? Our program for window development is no windows. Um, for, th for the beamlines that need the coherence, uh, I think if this is really what you're after, then you have to work windowless. Um, there are programs, I know in Japan at Spring 8, they have a program for beryllium windows, um, which are not rolled out of sheet metal, but um, I forget whether it's sputtered or evaporated. Um, that is the way to go if, for some reason, you cannot work without windows. But the best optics is no optics. Any other questions? I think earlier in your talk, you maybe quickly mentioned something about using um, spontaneous emission yeah. to look at time-resolved work. What did you mean by that, if I understood oh. correctly? We run the electron beam from the LINAC through a four and a half meter long undulator. This is not enough to get self-amplified spontaneous emission, SASE. Um, so that is what I call spontaneous emission. It's not an FEL. But it's quite a powerful source of very short uh, pulsed X-rays. It should deliver 10 to the 8 photons per pulse. So this is much less than what you get at an FEL, but it's also easier to do. And for Sweden, it's affordable. Any more questions? If not, let's thank Christoph for a very informative talk. Thank you.